My name is Jim Berg, and I'm a member of the OCamper board and uh, dean of the College of Professional Studies at Purdue University in Fort Wayne. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Popa. She has presented many times at OCamper on internal family systems, and it's a treat to have you here again. Iona Popa is a psychiatrist in private practice, a counselor, an adjunct assistant professor at Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline. Uh, she'll be presenting today on True Self and the Healing Presence, Christ as the Healer's Archetype in Spiritual Interventions Using Internal Family Systems and Psychosynthesis. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be back. Um, today, I want to present um, on Christ as healer's archetype and what does that tell us about spiritual intervention and any intervention in general as a, um, in various settings. And um, there's also going to be um, experiential things that we're going to do. So if, if you're thinking of just having a presentation where for an hour you're just going to listen to me talking, this might not be the best workshop to be in. Um, it'll be fun, hopefully. But my um, interest is what happens in healing encounters. And um, you know, doctors, psychologists, therapists, nurses, priests, chaplains, every ca caregivers, what is it that happens that can bring hope in people in need? And much has been written, of course, about the role and function of each vocation. And there's obviously secular ethical standards have been developed in each um, towards establishing professional, all sorts of vocational guidelines. But as Christians, I think there's much that can be learned from Christ and the way he interacted with the world in his healing ministry. And um, in this workshop, I want to use the foundation of Christ the Healer as an archetype and also to discern the different true self elements, true self as opposed to false el self, which is used a lot in psychology, and about his presence and the healing impact that that can have in interventions. Um, I wanted to start with, this is the outline. Let me see if I get this work. We'll review first different psychological models, and I've gonna, I'm gonna use a, a couple of slides that I used last year. I promise it won't be too long, I won't keep it too long. Um, but then we're gonna review also briefly internal family system and psychosynthesis with a focus on the healing presence. And since I presented on that before, and especially internal family system is gonna be very brief as well. And then really looking at uh, uniqueness of Christ. I'm always, you know, in a um, healing profession, we always hear about all sorts of um, teachers and religion and people trying to be really inclusive and, and Christ is just one more teacher along the way. But there are, I think there are things very unique about his uh, presence. Of course, we know that and how to discern that and how to uh, bridge that forward and also look at his, um, he, him as a healer, as a prototype, and then we'll do some experiential exercises. Um, I've got to, um, I had the honor to teach in uh, high school and also in college psychology, and I've been fascinated with the multitude of psychological threads. And um, one of the things that I've noticed, and it was uh, just so amazing that Dr. Renos was talking about those things as well, that in many psychological threads, the healer's position is of an expert. You know, we are there to um, tell, a, tell the person what to do. Um, they're usually we identify deficits or needs that need to be corrected or fulfilled. And the healer or, you know, that, whatever that capacity is, we have to do something to the patient. And or there's nothing else to do. And those psychological threads, you know, starting with Freud, um, talking about psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy, which they focus on internal psychic structure, behavioral psychology, they focus on, on conditioning, uh, external conditioning, cognitive psychology, they all focus on cognition, 
emotional based therapies, they focus on emotion, it's all about emotions, if we can only change that. Um, humanistic psychologies, they look at self-actualization. Um, attachment theories, uh, family system, imago therapy, they focus on relationship. And with attachment, you know, if you haven't had those attachments early on, you're kind of uh, done for life. Uh, biological psychiatry, they're all looking at um, what's happening in the brain, neurotransmitters, let me give you the pill. And being a psychiatrist, I've been at that end, you know, with visits of 15 minutes. How's your sleep? How's your appetite? Go up and down on the medication and I'll see you in a month. Um, there, and there's hope and there's importance to all of those approaches. Um, but I think what's different is everyone is trying to see their point of view and kind of bring that out the forefront and imagine that this is the only way of healing. And I wish they'll have the orthodox ethos, you know, diversity and unity, where it can see the bigger picture and there's all parts of this. Now, I've also encountered other types of psychological threads, and those are more um, described sometimes as transpersonal psychologies. Um, for, and in this, those types, the position, the healer position is different. He's not the expert. He's more the uh, guy, the collaborator. There's a synergy that Dr. Renos was talking about. And there are several models on that as well. And there's something about this that at the core of each human, there is something unknowable, something mysterious. Now those are not, now they're not theologians, right? But they discover it as you go into that depth that there's something there that's unknowable. And that kind of matches our apathetic theology. And also um, the healer, in the healer's position, again, I use this word uh, in general, a very wide range, is helping the other accessing that this healing presence internally. So therefore there's the collaboration. And, um, and I'm not um, necessarily covering all the types of psychological threads, but in those arenas, you might have heard of death psychology and Jungian psychology, where this idea that there is an unconscious and it's possible that God is, um, you know, seating of God is, is somewhere in there. Internal family system, they have this uh, possibility there's a true self at the core that is not a part of us. It's um, actually something, uh, again, unknowable, but it's, it's always there that's untouched, unharmed, that is calm and compassionate, they can bring healing. Um, psychosynthesis, they look at the possibility of the relationship with the divine through accessing uh, psychic integration and uh, different psychological functions. We've heard, we know about mindfulness-based therapies, you know, some of them are more, um, they don't necessarily include a, uh, a religious belief, but some they do. They have this possibility of healing through accessing universal compassion and awareness. So with all that, um, I've been in particularly interested in a couple of them. I've been trained, I'm internal family system trained and um, certified and did all the levels and assisted in trainings and the same for psychosynthesis. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about that, but this is my visual image about all those psychological threads. You know, they're all human concepts. They're kind of landing on something that is there and there's an overlap, but they, there is no theology, of course, it's the secular developments, but if Christ is at the center, kind of Christ holding everything, if it, when, once it resonates with that, we know we're, we're there. And I'm sure this conference, we're hearing a lot about many therapeutic modalities and interventions, and when we're hitting that, um, when God is there, healing happens, and we know it. Um, so let's review just a little bit uh, I'm, um, what are the internal family system saying about the presence, this true self, this potential divine presence, and what psychosynthesis is saying. Interestingly, internal family system um, developed by Dr. Dick Schwartz, he, he talks in his presentation, he was an atheist when he did this, and he was just very curious. In all, all of his methodologies, he just encountered roadblocks until he kind of gave up and said, you know what, I'm just gonna listen to my patients and just listen well. And then he discovered that there are different parts, psychological parts, but also that there was something at the core that was inexplicable. 
that um, he called it true self, and all this, this ability will heal the different parts, where there's calmness, curiosity, clarity, compassion, confidence, creativity, courage, and connectedness. And of course, uh, we picked up eight qualities. They all start with C. Uh, you know, coming from a different culture, this seems kind of a strange. Uh, I wondered if it would be in a different language, how did this will pan out. But nonetheless, those are the qualities. I, I like to equate many times compassion more with love. Uh, but you know, that's my, where I'm coming from. But this idea that um, all those are psychological parts in the right relationship with true self, and I will shift that into Holy Spirit, God, the image of God, that there is a transformation and then there's healing. Um, similarly, in so that's I, when I see patients, clients, that's what I see. I see the image of God in there. From a psychosynthesis point of view, and I believe this started early on, mid in the mid 20th century in, in Italy. Dr. Sagioli was a psychiatrist, um, and there's overlap between those two um, theories. This idea that there is a healing that's going to happen through psychological integration, and we have different psychological functions. They talk also about subpersonalities as parts. Um, and I like it. They talk about how to disidentify. They're a very practical way that we can disidentify for those psychological functions and really access a sense of presence. Um, and this presence, um, it's a way of being, is a way of healing and openness that what I would, oh, we will have some time to even practice is that when there's compassion with the listening. And from an Orthodox Christian perspective, I'm thinking of emptying oneself. We're emptying ourselves to the story, to the experience of the other. We stay in the mystery. And um, with a term that sometimes it's used is kenosis um, for that. Now, as I've been trained in all sorts of, um, almost all, not all, but many modalities, I've been always struck by two attitudes in general about faith. Either um, people that I interact with, um, there were the many um, healers or therapists, they do recognize Christ. They say it's a major prophet or teacher in the list of many of them and trying to kind of pacify all truths. There's this sense of acceptance. If I'm going to accept the other, the only, um, the, the only mindset that I can have is that all the religions are kind of equal. And other times, I'm experiencing people having particular um, faith beliefs, but they either don't engage in them, they kind of keep them really private, or if they discuss, it's kind of a circular kind of conversation, well, this is my truth versus your truth. So I had to really, people ask me all the time, and um, you know, how can I still be a believer? How can I still have a strong faith and I want to go to church? And really think about what is so different than Christ versus in this kind of argument that all our teachers and all are great and let's really um, honor them all, which makes sense uh, from a humanistic position. But from a Christian and psychological perspective, Christ is indeed unique. Uh, from a theological perspective, I mean, the good news, um, the tomb is empty. So what does that mean? That he has this ability of conquering death. So healing involves this. This is an ultimate healing that goes through suffering or death, that there is um, a different healing paradigm that has never been expressed in, in humanity. There's no other teacher that actually die and, and claim to be resurrected. And interesting, psychologically though, well you could say, well this was a story. Well, he could be, but Christ clearly did not try to establish a trend to become, he wasn't trying to have a movement to become a guru or whatever. He was not popular, and actually his death arose great fear and denial, including people who followed him. I mean, the apostles kind of, their, their defense mechanism and protective reactions were all triggered and they all scattered. So how to explain that? What helped to overcome uh, social, normal social reactions against the fear of death for the church actually to come back together? Something happened. 
uh, there was no other individual or social or psychological explanation for that of believers coming together. So he clearly, something happened. He, he resurrected and the Holy Spirit really moved people to come together and to develop the church. Um, with that, I'm always going back to Christ. What did Christ do? What he would do in different healing interactions? What can we learn? I mean, there's so much in different professions that are telling us we have to do this technique, that technique, or you have to have this standards. So part of that, I've been um, looking and studying the different types of healing. And as I looked through them, someone mentioned earlier today there were 26. I think that's about it. And I looked through the different Gospels and kind of looking, you know, my, my um, thinking part likes to classify things. So I said, what kind of healings and how do I really understand them even from uh, as, a, as a physician? I would say there are general healings and we will see in many of the Gospels uh, where Christ just, there, there are uh, depictions of him healing multitudes by the sea in the evening. There are specific healings in the gospel uh, where specific body disorders where the will and the consciousness of the person seems preserved. They're not affected. And we're gonna focus on this one, the second one. But there's also healing of general body diseases when there's little or no consciousness or will. For example, the depiction where the mother, Peter's mother-in-law when she had a fever or um, uh, paralytic, it's not clear paralytic, I think it can go to both, so I'm gonna bring it also in a um, for second category. There's also healings of demoniacs, um, where from a spiritual point of view, it almost seems that there is no will, you know, the person is, is overcome by something, there's no consciousness or will, and we have the healing of the demoniac in the synagogue, the one in the tomb with a swine, uh, healing of the boy possessed by spirit. Uh, when the father is, is really exasperated because the boy is uh, uh, throwing himself in the fire, water. Um, there's also healing um, mysteries, I'm sorry, healing encounters uh, when there's death. Um, so, you know, at, at 21st century, someone will say, well, those could be near death experiences. Um, there's actually a very interesting study that has been done um, by a nurse um, about that. And that's the story in the Bible, the story of the widow with the son, Anain, and uh, Jairus' daughter. And also there's a depiction of healing at a distance. So kind of looking through that, and there is probably a topic here to expand on many other levels, but just for different spiritual interventions, I just wanted to um, focus a little bit on healing on specific body disorders. And the, um, those are the four ones that I'm just gonna focus before we draw some conclusions when we try something experientially. The first one I want to talk about is a leprosy and just kind of look at how, what was Christ's position in interacting. Then um, also healing the um, uh, man with a withered hand, the woman with hemorrhage, and the healing of the paralytic. And I have here the different uh, references from which gospels are coming from. Um, let me start with a cleansing the leper. Um, there are several accounts, one is one and one there's several, but the one when Christ, into, I'm gonna focus on the one when he encounters one leper, uh, he starts asking Christ to make him clean and it's very interesting, he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So the leper from the start is not, it almost comes across not putting any pressure on Christ but acknowledge his free will. And this brief exchange is packed, almost you sense the respect and the dignity in the interaction uh, and respect of each other's free will. And Jesus in turn accepts this invitation and makes the leper clean. And Mark's add that Jesus even was moved with pity with him. And at the end, Christ admonishes the cleansed leper not to say anything to anyone, but to show himself to the priest. And this is striking to me for a couple of reasons. From a psychological point of view, it's clear that Christ's healing gestures was not to fulfill his own ego or his own need for self-worth or whatnot. 
And as human healers, when we experience great success in our work, we can feel an urge or a pull towards recognition. And that's just a natural kind of human reaction. And there is, we have a much needed modern confidentiality law, right? We cannot break that. It, this, and kind of puts a break to this natural desire to be affirmed and recognized for our good works. But really, Christ emptied himself and performed this amazing acts of healing without any personal benefit. He simply responded to the simple but heartfelt request from the leper. And not only he healed the man, but he truly respected the Jewish tradition, which at, at that time when you were healed, you were asked to go to be, uh, bring yourself to the priest as Moses commanded. So, not, so it's so much more significant that Christ's gesture he had no constraints to confidentiality to block this natural tendency. And then he just, he just said that, no, don't say that to anyone. Like how many times we see leaders in any capacity nowadays, right, and across centuries, that they build their success and let the world know of their deeds in order to impress others, and there's none of that. So in our turn, um, as we do our deeper work, internal healing, we can befriend those natural impulses as well and help transcend them, not just because we have to. Um, also, Christ models for us in that interaction um, the process afterwards, after the healing process, Christ separated himself from the people he healed in order to regenerate. And then he withdrew, quote, to the wilderness and he prayed. And in a similar way, and I've um, presented this last year about the benefit of separating physically and emotionally after healing encounters or any caregiver encounters in order, not to, regen in order to regenerate and not burn out. Now, the next one, the men with the withered hand, this uh, encounter, Christ is in the synagogue, and the Pharisees actually questioned him of the rules of healing in order to test him. They were not really interested in the healing aspect, but it, Christ seeks out the man with the withered hand and invites him to be healed. So this time, the healing is prompted by Christ's desire to correct the underlining assumption of the time, the association of healing with works, which work, of course, was forbidden on the Sabbath. So this new story, this new deeper meaning of healing, it's thus restored. It's a more of an act of mercy, grace, restoration of human dignity and completeness, and not just a to-do or something we put on a um, to-do list. And in Luke, it's actually apparent that Christ is aware that the scribes and the Pharisee, this is a trap. So they were watching him. So another interesting element to this is Christ's courage to do the right thing, knowing fully well possible consequences. So that's a great model for us also as healers and an inspiration that sometimes things that need to, things that we, we do, they're not gonna be necessarily well received. The third one I'm, we're looking today is the woman with the hemorrhage. And in this miracle, the woman is aware of their desire to be healed, but Christ as a healer actually is not. The healing occurs spontaneously, and Christ, it's almost as if Christ cannot help himself but heal others just by the nature of who he is. And the woman's dialogue is this, if I touch even his garments, I shall be made well. And how great was her faith and hope. So in those times, it had a double burden of having no rights. On one hand, she was a woman, and barely being a woman, they had no rights. And on the other hand, she was considered the most unclean of the unclean because of the bleeding. So Christ, interestingly, in hindsight, of course, we're not surprised by Christ's response. He was very compassionate, and, and, but at the time, this was quite shocking because she, she was untouchable. So first, um, Christ is aware that someone touched him and the power came out of him. And then his response is full of compassionate and filled with grace and there was no sense of anger or, or barrier and why not. There was no judgment, no repulsion coming from Christ. So he, Christ really exemplifies openness, respect to all humankinds for the dejected of the time. And I always think, okay, but how about now? How about in 21st century? Who are the dejected in our, in our society right now? And how are we responding to that? Could we embody that compassion and fearless courage? And what would that look like in our, in our place where we live? 
Another point out of this is that, we know we talk about um, the will and the hope and the interest of the patient. If they want to be healed, it really makes a difference as opposed to help rejection. That's very important. And also, um, in IFS, where internal family system work, it's a careful attention given to the will of each part, internal part, and in connection to the true self. So there's also a recognition to the dignity, not only of the person, but also of the parts that are made in the image of God. Um, and I'm also curious about placebo effect. You know, when we talk nowadays about, oh, this is placebo effect, kind of in science is a little put down. You know, it's one of those things we can think we get better, we get better. Well, what if this is because of faith? Faith, we're getting better. Um, so it's not talked about the faith of the person who's actually seeking help. She had faith, and it was um, really had an impact. And the third point I want to make about this, it's really subtle, but it appeared that almost like Christ's human awareness was lagging behind his godly healing ability. Like he was not aware that this happened and just aware that power came out of him. And the subtle distinction, I think, models for us healers in a unique way. There is no need to always be aware of all the implications and consequences of our healing actions and words. Um, as long as we allow ourselves to be the vehicle of God's providence and healing power, so it speaks about the faith of the healer in the process, and um, that things can happen if we are aware of not. And how many times we have made an intervention and we had no idea, and then we hear later we meet a person or something happens, and we're like, "Wow, I, I had this impact in your life. I had no clue." So faith seems important not only for the one who's healed, but also for the healer. And in a different, of other parts of the Bible, Christ talks about faith, especially as, actually when he talks about healing the boy possessed by spirit. So I'm digressing a little bit, but I just want to bring the three metaphors of faith that he uses that can inspire us in our work. One is the um, metaphor of truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of the mustard seed, you say to this mountain, move here, and there's, there's going to move, and nothing will be impossible to you. I wonder how will this look in our work? if we really believe that. The second beautiful metaphor is moving a mountain into the sea by faith. And this is in Matthew and Mark. And you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. And the third metaphor is uh, the Luke's, uh, the parable has to do with the second tree. Uh, be rooted up and be planted into the sea and you'll obey you. There's such majestic and awe-inspiring metaphors about how faith look like and how little do we actually need, the mustard of seed. Now moving on to the last um, healing encounter that I'm, I'm addressing today is the healing of the paralytic. There are encounters in all um, Gospels. In the three synoptic Gospels, the story goes in a very similar way um, with a paralytic. And there is a question, um, where the community actually brings the paralytic through the roof and he, Christ did encounter them. And there is the question, the Pharisees are there also and they're really um, challenge him again. And Christ's response is, for each is, which is easier to you? Your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and rise? It is easy to think of forgiving sins many times just from a spiritual perspective, but I think this points also to the importance of connection between mind and soul and the body connection, the bidirectionality, that it's not just spiritual healing, physical healing, and it's been true in my work in, with internal family system that many actually of our parts are also rooted in, in the body and they can come up. And this is not just in IFS, I mean the many, you know, psychosomatic medicine is dealing just with that, this idea that there is strong connection between our emotions, our thoughts, and our bodies, and vice versa. And here, you, here Christ was doing just that. Um, the other important thing in this encounter to me was striking that this healing was prompted actually by the community. 
It was not, the story doesn't go with a paralytic exit for help. I'm talking about the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But they bring him to, the community brings him to Christ, and then Christ asks, what do you want, or what do you need? Do you want to be healed? So then there is also this intention and desire for healing from the community. And the people around the paralytic went actually to great lengths, you know, to remove the roof, to go down, you know, if you have got in a class, really understanding even how the structure of the house looked like, it was pretty complex to do all that. And the community really, this is what moved Christ. And everyone, um, as, as they brought forth, healing happened. And it reminds me of our work not just uh, at our workplace, but also in church and our sacramental life when the entire community is praying. Like there's something really uh, deep that could happen through that, through the, the prayers of our entire community. In John's Gospels though, interestingly, there is a story of a paralytic is by the pool now, but interesting that they, although he's surrounded by people, it almost seems reading through the lines that the community didn't quite care. Like this man was there for years and years and years and no one actually put him in the water and he's keep waiting for that moment. So everyone else seemed concerned with their own healing and there was no compassion coming from him. So in this time, Christ really reaches to the paralytic in his usually fashion and he doesn't say, it's always in his interaction, Christ never says, oh, I'll heal you. He always asks, do you want to be healed? What do you want? What do you need? There's an invitation and there's that, that um, synergistic movement that happens as opposed to, oh, I know what you need. You have a withered hand, here you go. And you, it'll fix that. So in this case, the paralytic really responds to that and um, Christ heal him with the same command that is in the other gospels. Do rise, take up your pallet and walk. Um, and interestingly, in, in the Synoptic Gospels, when the community really wanted him to be healed, there was, there was a sense, there was noted, they were amazed. They really, you see their responses, but in John, there's no mention of, of that. Probably the crowd didn't even notice. Now, with this, what are some of the lessons for, for the healers? Um, what I'm sensing in all of them, there's an engagement of the free will. There's always an asking, do you want? Do you want to be healed? What do you want? There's a sense of do not tell others, um, letting go of ego, not taking credit. Um, there is a need to regenerate. Christ really separates from the healing and, and to find, you know, to complete the cycle of healing and prevent burnout in a way. Um, healing is seen as an act of mercy grace, restoration of human dignity. There's something very touching. He's always seeing something beautiful in the other. Um, there's a tenderness, also compassion towards human needs and longings when he's asking that, you know, what do you need? And there's an interconnection between body and soul as well that it's clear. And also, I'm noticing the courage against the rules or the laws of the day. You know, he, didn't re he, he did the right thing. Um, the stress on faith, faith of the healed one, faith of the healer, faith of the community. And the two last points which are kind of intricated with the presentations is that the healing happens in relationships. And this is not unheard of in psychological world. I mean, when they've tried different psychotherapy, there's a study, they've tried all sorts of psychotherapy modalities, and the only thing that finally at the end, or the core, was the relationship. That the relationship between the patient or client and the therapist was the one that actually made the most change as opposed to the different therapeutic approach. Um, and, the other element is the emptying oneself and love one another. And that's the trickiest one to do. I mean, I can say to myself, okay, I'm gonna just empty myself, I'm just gonna be present. 
thoughts run to our head 24-7. They come, you know, as Father Thaddeus is saying, like clouds in the sky, emotions come, our beliefs are so subtle, we don't even recognize them as Dr. Um, Renos was saying earlier, right, with the epistemology, that we're not even aware the kind of the subtle cultural family beliefs that we're having. So what does that look like to be really empty? Are we really emptying ourselves and really hearing the others? Or do we have different um, beliefs? Do we, we we're always going to have something. But there are ways to still to facilitate that and make it a little more uh, open and more explicit, and I would say with the internal family system and psychosynthesis, there is a way to really disidentify, or IFS will say unblend from the different parts. There is way, they're, they're very subtle. We have very subtle shifts in our consciousness. We don't even know it. We think it's always I who holding the microphone, but actually there are many reactions that can hold the microphone in our internal world. And the, the transition is very subtle. So, for example, we can be just fine, and all of a sudden, we we'll get, get really hungry. We very subtly going to start thinking about food, right? And we don't even notice the transition. So those transitions are very, very subtle. But they, they do, um, the psychosynthesis and, and IFS are more proactive in identifying that and finding really practical way to disidentify from them. So with that, we have the possibility now to do some exercises just for um, a couple of minutes. I have a few of them. One just for maybe five, seven minutes or ten. Uh, we'll see how long it will take and depending on that we'll, we'll move into the second exercise. But there's a way, you know, when um, our, our faith, is uh, Orthodox faith, talks a lot about Jesus' prayer and how to really descend our thoughts into our heart. What does that mean and how to really open our heart in a way that feels open, that feels really open to God, we opens to the other. So. I have an exercise that we could do in, in watchfulness or contemplation that we can um, try to disidentify it about, uh, with a few things. So are we all on board with that? So here's the, the choices. I'm really excited. I want to try this. Eh, not sure. Oh, uh, I'd rather hit my thumb in a car door than do this right now. So what's, what's the, what's the uh, mood here? Okay, okay. So as we try this, um, we can do, uh, you can keep your eyes open, you can keep your eyes closed. If you keep your eyes open, it's better sometimes to look a little down, you know, not to get distracted. Um, so just let's sit down, as you sit down, just find a comfortable position. And sometimes it helps to have a comfortable position with your back straight. Um, with have allow for bra uh, better breathing. So we will do a few prompts, and then at some point we'll we'll say the Jesus prayer. And I would say at any point, you know, whatever I'm saying, feel if you really it feels right to you, follow. If not, just throw it out the window. I know there's no windows here, but in our imaginary window. So as you sit comfortable, notice just for a few moments that, oh, there are windows. Um, there are a lot of them, okay. So, so this is a part of me, right, that just came in, my, my humorous part, and kind of got me distracted, all right. So let's take some deep breath as you sit. I'm gonna sit as well in a comfortable position. And then let's take some deep breath and just notice for a few moments that actually nothing is happening. There is no problem to solve. There's no task at hand. And actually the chair, the floor, the earth is doing all the work right now supporting us. There's really nothing we have to do. Just take some deep breath really deliberately. Breath of God just coming in our body, regenerating us. And let's do a quick body scan. We'll try to quiet our body first by just noticing our body. 
with awareness from inside. Just notice the liveliness of your body. Maybe there are some touch points. Maybe you have some pain or tension. What if for a moment there's nothing to do about that? We don't have to change it. You can just observe it and be aware. And just notice sensations with no judgment. And just be aware of that you have sensations, but you are not your sensations only. Notice that you have a body, but you're not just a body. And if it feels right to send some gratitude to our bodies and invite it to relax even more, And as you take some deep breath, maybe saying a Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And just notice that all of us, we have thoughts. They go 24-7, except we're sleeping. Sometimes not even then, they quiet. Just notice your thoughts like clouds in the sky. What if for a few moments you don't have to engage in the content? Just notice them. And just notice that you have thoughts, but you are not only your thoughts, you're more than that. And just notice the space that's holding your, you and your thoughts. And keep taking a few deep breaths. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Sending gratitude to your thoughts. And just send an invitation for them to relax as well. With no pressure, no agenda, just being. And you might notice feelings. Ask yourself, what feeling am I experiencing right now? You can just name it for yourself. Maybe no feeling so whatsoever. And just notice that you have feelings, but we're more than our feelings. And notice the space that's holding them as well. Sending gratitude for them. We need them. They warn us. Anger, anxiety, joy, happiness, disgust, fear. They're just warning. They're signals. They come and go like the thoughts. And as you breathe, just invite God as breath or Jesus' prayer even more. Just make that invitation. We can only be open to the grace of God. And the grace of God is, God is gonna do what he's gonna do but we can be present. So just inhale, God, and you can even imagine exhaling any burdens or hurts or, and just find your rhythm. In being, in being who you are and in the same time, more. And as we're going to transition back in a minute, 
notice that we don't have to do this abruptly. There is a way to come open and close and be aware of the inside and the outside in the same time. So just experiment that with yourself. You know, just open if you had it closed and close again. See if you can be connected both with your breath and the sense of who you are inside while you're aware of the outside. Maybe this is what some of our ancestors talk about praying incessantly. And just start transitioning to the room. Maybe wiggle your feet, your hands. Just keep opening up slowly. And as you transition out, see if there's a word or a couple of words that could describe what you're dis experiencing that you could share with the group. Peace. Peace. Presence. Presence. Anyone else? Rest, restfulness, healing. healing. Yeah, what else? Contentment. Contentment, yeah, there's a hand in the back. Tension. Tension, yeah, so something is going on, there's tension, yeah. Anything else? Biofeedback. Biofeedback, yeah. I like that. I'm here. Hmm? I'm here. I'm here, yes. Community. Yeah. Anyone resonated with the words that you've here heard so far? I see your sharp hands. Yeah. Okay. Anything else that hasn't been named? Fatigue. Fatigue. Yeah, we're noticing our fatigue, that's right. What else? Time has stopped. Anyone else experience that? Yeah. So in this presence, as we experience this, what if from this space we can listen to another person, if it feels peaceful? If we're fatigued, of course, we might need to have more sleep, or if we're tense, you know, to find ways to relax. But what if there is a sense of presence and a sense of peace, and we would listen to an, another person this way? So the last exercise we're going to do, just for a few minutes, we're going to be, you're going to pair up with someone, and here's what we're going to do for a few minutes. One person talks, and you can talk about anything you want, and you're just going to talk. And the other person, the listener, just practice presence. Just practice being energetically. You know, where sometimes when we listen, what do we do? We kind of nod, and yes, I get it, or respond. What if we don't do that, and we can just be present energetically, and see how this feels, and then we'll switch. So can you pick up a diet? Can you pick up a person? Be someone you know, someone you don't know. Let's see how this feels. So I'll give the timing. So decide who's the listener and who's the talker. And just be aware of the body, of the energy and the presence. Is everyone ready? All right. Do we have, raise your hand if you're going to be the listener now. Who's the listener right now? All right. All right, well, let's get going. Let's see how it goes. Play with it and see what you discover. All right, it's time to wrap up and thank your listener and your person who shared. And I'm aware that we are 
a minute or a couple of minutes away from um, our break. I'll have to, I'll have to stop. But any, any questions, and of course I'll be available for questions afterwards. I don't want to take all your break time. But any questions, there's a, maybe a couple. Okay, uh, I'm a massage therapist and acupuncture physician and uh, the token alternative medicine person here, I believe. But uh, I've been doing massage for 42 years. And there, I, I th what I like very much what you said, that there is actually a physical, we're, we're not, we're a unity. We're not uh, a psychological, we don't have a psychological self and a physical self and a spiritual self. We're all one self. We just, we kind of divide them up here, but that, I don't think that that's really true. And there are uh, physical manifestations to emotional states that's called affect. And I run into that all the time when I'm working with people. If someone stays in a, a, a a physical position too long, they get stuck in it. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has chronic depression, they take on a physical posture of depression. And I think it's very, very important that if someone has a chronic uh, emotional state, that they get body work in order to help them get out of that chronic state because the body has reacted to it and it will get stuck there. It will, it will reach a homeostasis in that particular, uh, particular mode of being. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, just continuing on the previous thought, uh, I'm, I think most of you here are aware that uh, by using um, physical exercise techniques, they can also heal the psyche and soul. And for example, aerobic exercise was found to have the same healing results as antidepressants. So it, we are both, we are a unit. Okay, two questions for your presentation. The one, the very short one, uh, the first one is very short. Is what we did in exercise one a kind of meditation? Contemplation. I the question is, is this a kind of meditation? I think we can call it in different ways. Uh, I particularly appreciate, um, I believe it's in Nika Forrest in, in um, one of Philokalia when he talks, how do we call it? We call it watchfulness, contemplation, we call it meditation. We can call it in all sorts of ways, but it's one experience. So this experience of being inward and being aware, so we can have a different, our tradition is filled with contemplating practices. I think that's a term that usually in our faith we use. Other people use meditation. Um, we can go into a discussion about what the difference, I, I, I wanted to just stay with just the actual experience. Okay, thank you very much. And the second question, uh, it's like a comment actually. I think you said before when the, the therapist uh, when God is present into a therapy, then healing takes place. But sometimes I think this is not the case. For example, there might be a therapist who is faithful and the patient who is faithful, but healing doesn't happen. Hmm? And in other cases, when none of them is faithful and the healing happens. So it's, it's not always the case, I think, of course, faith facilitates healing, but it's not always the case that healing will happen, isn't right. it? Yes. Thank you. So I would, uh, totally, like faith is important, but there are, are skills. So there are skillful ways of healing others. In the same way you go to a doctor, right? Some doctors are more skillful than others, and you can get um, better quicker, right, if they're faithful or not. Yes, there are also skillful techniques that can help people heal on top of that, of course. Okay. Yes. All right. The sign is we have to stop. So thank you so much, and then we'll have a wonderful break.